Okay. Scriptural That's case. It. All right. Let us let us get right started. And I think we get I think we commence with the OG passage itself, Exodus chapter 20. Um, the second commandment to be nice and specific. Um, but yes, I'll just read that section. I'll just read that section out here. So I've got this very nice step Bible. Thank you very much, River, for showing me this, like literally just before this stream. I've never seen this thing before. <laughs> it is super awesome, super helpful. And so this passage reads. And God spoke, and by the way, this is the ESV translation, but we have the OG language as well. So if someone wants to freak out about how the ESV does things, don't worry, you got the language right here. Um, and God spoke all these things saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall now bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord, your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, uh, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So pretty much what we'd say in a positive articulation, this is just our case right here. It's not even a matter of uh, a passage gives some principles and some ideas, and then we logically um, build up to our position. It, this is just quite literally, we, we submit, this is just our position straight up. You shall not make a carved image or any likeness of anything in earth, earth above or below. You shall not bow down to them. You shall not serve them. That's quite simple. That's quite simply our case, of course, in, yeah. as we would argue. Just to clarify though, we are interpreting this commandment to be saying that the, the, the focus of the commandment is on the don't bow. You can yeah. obviously make a carved image of something. God commands that later on. Um, but it's the bowing before it that's the the issue that's at hand. It. Now, yeah, that's it. Um, the really important thing to make clear about this, and we're going to have to get into a little bit of uh, Greek for for people. Nicaea two will end up saying there's a distinction between proskuneo and latruo. Proskuneo hmm. is what's typically translated as veneration, and latruo is what's typically translated as vener as sorry as worship. Proskuneo veneration, latruo worship. Here in this commandment, in the LXX or the Septuagint translation, which ironically the Eastern Orthodox Church considers to be the sort of standard Bible, and the Roman Catholic Church, correct me if I'm wrong, since they have the, um, oh, I've completely blanked on what it's called, the, the Latin translation of the Bible. Ah, uh, the Vulgate. The Vulgate. The Vulgate's Old Testament is based on the Septuagint. So the Septuagint translation... Uh, when God says you shall not bow down to them or serve them, the Greek verb for bow down is proskunesis from proskuneo. And the Greek word for serve them is latrusis. So he's saying thou shalt not venerate or worship them. <laughs> so mm. he's making mm. it pretty clear that you can't, you can't use this, this silly distinction to get out of this one because they're both there. And I think Paul and I said before the stream started that we believe that's that is literally divine providence. Um, <laughs> God made More sure or that would happen. So uh, yeah, but okay, yeah. I think we'll we'll move it, on. It's we'll either get... divine providence or just like a genuine, like hilarious blunder on the part of the icon of duels at the council. Because as far as I've as far as I've read, like the second commandment just does not exist in the second council of Nicaea. Like they just do not. They don't even they don't even bother to try to give an account for it, and uh, I think either either they just genuinely forgot about it, which would be like an absolute miracle of silliness, or they saw how their own terminology like would destroy them, and then they're just like, mm -hmm. and that and that kind of makes sense because um, as uh, actually as father, uh, you know, I think I'll, I think I'll leave as the thing, but basically, Nicaea two didn't really give, um, ironically, didn't really actually articulate a full-throated positive theology of image veneration it was primarily apologetic so just defending the practice itself um with with certain statements on theology here and there but otherwise it didn't really try to give a full coherent vision of what they actually believe which is very important very very important mm -hmm. um yeah. but yeah is there any any more you want to say here river no i, I think the, com the commandment speaks for itself obviously uh some roman catholics and eastern orthodox will say this is not a commandment in and of itself it's they they have a different order of the Ten Commandments. So they'll say this is part of the first commandment. I think the case to refute that is pretty open and shut, but I don't even think we need to get into yep. it. Um, and I don't it think it affects it anyway. 
Yeah, I don't think I, I think that'd just be a big that'd just be a big red herring anyway, because like what actually changes with the fact that not making a carved image of any likeness in anything that is in heaven above or on the earth below or in the sea under the earth. Are the saints and the Virgin Mary and all that, are they things which are on earth or in the heavens above and the water below and all that? If that if that is the case, then it, and it frankly doesn't matter because to simply give such a, a an attempt at a prescriptive argument like, oh, it just says don't to do it, not to do it about gods. And oh, we don't consider the saints gods. But that's actually really, shall we say, linguistically arrogant when you think about it. It's just like, oh, look, they labeled these things gods. We don't label our things gods. So therefore it doesn't apply to us. Yeah, which exactly. is absolutely silly. What's, what makes something a god is its function in the scripture. And with scripture, it's quite simply just supernatural beings that have some have devotion dedicated towards them. It really oh, not is even that. Because I can call emperors and stuff gods too. Um, so yeah. Judges as well. I um, just answered a question in the chat. We were talking about Greek Greek verbs there. Yeah, we're talking uh, about Greek, um, which is most relevant because um, the, the Septuagint was like the primary version used by much of the early church um, yeah. because Hebrew apparently well, didn't really care much about it, unfortunately. Uh, and likewise for the Second Council of Nicaea, the Septuagint they would use. But then when we actually look at the text of the Septuagint itself, it's like, oh boy, oh dear, There's some big problems there for their own uh, position. But then likewise, we can also look at the Hebrew um, itself where it would say, and because uh, ironically, the Septuagint, one could say it's a bit more specific than the Hebrew otherwise is. So the Septuagint would say Latruo. And on the basis of that, um, Iconoduals may say, oh, look, it's just saying not to Latruo images, which is cool because we don't Latruo images, or rather we say we don't Latruo images. We just dually them. We just slap some dually on it and call it a day and that therefore it's okay. Um, but then of course, if you look at the Hebrew itself where it uses, uh, it uses more specific wording much 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 more specific wording um quite simply abad you shall not serve it's a very generic word abad serve service um it doesn't have any particular uh connotation of worship as to the one true transcendent god as would often latria be defined it just simply means service it's it's very simple um but yeah not much else here or and peter's um there's actually a that's actually a bit of a um I don't, I don't really know what's going on there, but there's a bit of a misunderstanding. In, in Nicaea 2, it's it's Latruo and Proskuneo that yeah. they differentiate. Yeah, And people right. are bringing this Dulia thing, but that's not actually there in Nicaea 2, just to clarify yeah. that. It, it, either way, Dulia is meant to show the same concept, but otherwise, yes, Proskuneo is the word used by the used by the council itself. Yeah. Um, okay, what was Can our... Yeah, let's move on. So our next passage is... Uh, Deuteronomy 27, I believe. Yeah, so there's there's, a, there's there's quite a few little. I mean, like it's there's there's countless little things in the Bible yeah. talking about how you shouldn't, you know, venerate images. So Deuteronomy 27, he shall be cursed who makes a carved or cast metal image, which is an abomination to the Lord. Right. I mean, that there's there's lots of stuff like that. But I think where it gets quite interesting is when we look at the prophets. So I've, I'm going to go. I'm going to jump to Isaiah 42, Paul. Uh, it says, uh, God does not give his glory to carved idols. Uh, yeah. Now, this is important. This is saying that because um, people are going to say, oh, whenever the Bible says you can't venerate images, that's talking about images of false gods. But here it's saying God himself, the only true God, Yahweh, does not give his glory to idols. Yeah. So, so it's saying you can't make an image of the true God. Um. In Isaiah 40, this happens again. To whom then God asks, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A, cast, a, a craftsman casts it. So again, saying you can't, God's likeness cannot be sh shown in a, in a lifeless image made by some dude. Uh, God is much bigger than that. And then in, in um, Jeremiah 10, uh, God says, Images are the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the goldsmith. They are all the works of skilled men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. So again, you can't have the almighty God be resembled or reflected in some silly image painted by some guy. Mm -hmm. um, so... The say you can't say, oh, the the Old Testament is only talking about images of false gods because God Himself is yeah is ruling that out. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, and as I said, something I was going to make a bit more clear with Exodus was how they do this linguistic prescriptivism where they where they'll say, oh, it just says not to do it of gods. We don't consider the saint gods, saints gods. Therefore, it's okay. Um, but I wanted to make I wanted to make more clear as well as the fact that with the terms for gods, so particularly in Hebrew, Elohim, that doesn't just refer to um beings who are who who have a who have like who are like this high transcendent ruling thing. It's not saying what iconodules will say, and you shall not worship another being as the transcendent creator God. It simply says you shall not worship basically supernatural beings. That's pretty much what Elohim refers to because virtually any supernatural being, even dead human spirits, like in first Samuel, when the spirit of Samuel is brought up, it's called an Elohim. Um, and it's one of the only times in scripture that that happens. So that is kind of a significant use. Um, and so any, any supernatural being can be referred to as an Elohim. So if you want to give like a more wooden translation, you could say you shall have no, you shall have no other beings, non-material, non-corporeal beings before me, which of course, the saints in heaven, they 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 kind they they would kind of be included in that category. So that's that's a significant thing to consider. Something doesn't isn't a god just because something isn't a god or not a god just because you claim it is or is not a god. It's a god by virtue of just 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 what it is, just, just what it is. Yeah. Um. So that, that's an important distinction. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. And even if you depict, if you if you were to try and depict Yahweh for an image, that would that would in and of itself become an idol automatically because it would be a false representation because Yahweh can't be depicted in an image. Of course, we're going to end up, you know, Jesus is the image of God and that sort of stuff, but we will get to that in due course. And to answer yep. a question there, um, yes, we are saying that that is a single principle. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's because that's an extremely common feature in, in Hebrew, in the Hebrew scriptures especially, that they'll, they'll give like, couplets that say the same thing and that actually is a critical uh that is actually a critical point that fatally that that basically fatally refutes a certain key proof text that the second council and ICA uses for the latria dulia distinction or latria proscuneo distinction um but we'll get to that when we when we yeah. get to that but it's, yes it's funniest part of the council probably uh, yeah, yeah it is it really is <laughs> okay are you ready to move on to the new testament witness Yep, 100%. Let's do it. Um, okay, so first of all, the Old Testament injunctions against images are never lifted, ever, yep. not once. The New Testament explicitly lists the injunctions about circumcision, sacrifice, eating certain meats, etc. Those are the the ones that are annulled. Uh, they they the New Testament says they're annulled. Um, and by the way, <laughs> you know. And in Acts 15, obviously, it, it makes it very clear which ones, um, well, I don't know, that's a tangent maybe we shouldn't get down to about the whole not eating blood thing. But yeah, so mm -hmm. the, the images yeah. thing is 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 not in, uh, lifted. So you can't presume that they've been lifted if the New Testament ever makes that clear. Now, the New Testament does seem to be saying the same thing as the Old Testament, that God can't be depicted in an image. Uh, so Paul in Romans 1.23 says uh, he repudiates those who have exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Again, if scripture is perspicuous, then we're going to read that on its perspicuous level. So what is the plain sense of that passage? You can't depict the immortal God in images. John 4.24, Jesus himself says, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The point of what Jesus is saying there is that God's worship cannot be located sort of in the physical sense because the Samaritan woman is saying, oh, well, you know, you worship in Jerusalem, we worship here. And Jesus is saying, you're looking at it all wrong. God is spirit. You can't worship him in this sort of local sense. And that clearly can be applied to images. Um, like, you know, the, the sort of pop level Roman Catholic devotion where if you're praying in front of a statue of Jesus, it's sort of like a better prayer sort of thing. We're just ruling all that out in John 4. Okay, so and then um, here's a classic one. Acts 17 verse 29, Paul says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the, that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. That is like, <laughs> I don't really know how, how clear you need the Bible to be than that. This is oh, in the sorry. New Testament. This is after Christ's ascension. 
And Paul is saying, the divine being is not like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. <laughs> now, of course, of course, to be fair, the icon jewels they say, oh, we know the glory of God is not like that. We know the glory of God is incorruptible. We're just saying it's okay to depict him and all that. But what they what they don't really see is how, okay, cool, you agree with that. But what scripture is saying is that it is on the basis of that principle that you cannot depict God. You cannot just create another principle that then permits it. They are actually not permitting the creation of images at all on the basis of that principle. And if you agree with that principle, if this wasn't a thing in scripture and you just had the freedom to like derive whatever principles, whatever application of principles you want, that'd be one thing. Fact is though, the scripture does say, don't make images because the glory of God does not rest. It is, is, is incomparable to, um, to mortal corruptible images. And so that, that's the principle. That's what you got to play by. The scripture gives the principles, but also gives in many aspects, in many areas, especially this one, it gives the application. And according to scripture, the application of the principle that God's glory cannot be reflected in corruptible images is therefore don't make images of God. And so Nicaea too fundamentally just says, um, obviously inadvertently, but they fundamentally say, mm, nah, that application is wrong. We're going to make a new application. That's fundamentally what it does. Yeah. yeah. And remember, like we said at the beginning, we are presupposing the sufficiency of scripture. That's right. So if these are the only texts in scripture that talk about images and they are always negative, so let's repeat that. Every single time scripture talks about images or the veneration of images, it's negative in the New Testament and the Old Testament. And we're going to presuppose that scripture is sufficient. That's it. That's the answer. Um if you're going to say, oh, no, 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 actually, you can do this, blah, blah, blah. well, scripture never said that you can. And every time it talked about this issue, it said you can't. So, yeah. Yep. Okay. Acts 14, Paul encourages his listeners to turn from these worthless things to the living God. The implication, again, being the living God cannot be depicted in a worthless image. So that's that about images. The New Testament has almost nothing to say about images that we literally have quoted the only times the New Testament ever yep. talked about. There are other times the New Testament talks about idols, you know, repeatedly says turn from idols. You know, in John's letter, he says, children, turn away from idols. But people are going to say, oh, idols, that means false gods. Um, so we've decided to not go into those. But even without going into those, our case is still strong. Yep. But now we get to the really, I think, probably a better argument than this stuff is what the New Testament says about venerating apostles and angels. So in Acts 10, 25 to 26, we read this. When Peter entered, Peter, the apostle Peter, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and venerated him. The Greek verb there is proskunason, proskuneo, venerate. Mm -hmm. Venerate, guys, not worship, venerate. But Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I too am a man. Peter refuses. Mm -hmm. Cornelius's veneration, and he uh, he chastises him for it. He says, "You cannot venerate me." Now, hold on a minute. If you, oh, actually, before uh, let me let me get to the next one first, and I'll make my point. All the right. other one is Revelation nineteen ten. So John himself he falls um, down at the feet of an angel. Um, I fell down at his feet to venerate again. The Greek word there in this case the, the um, case it's in is uh, proskuneisai, but again the root is proskuneo. Uh, I fell down at his, feet, at his feet to venerate him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Venerate God. Hmm. Here's our point. There's if, a great idea. If veneration is forbidden to be shown to angels and apostles in person, why on earth could you venerate an image of them? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, as Nicaea to themselves would say, an image is still is still a subordinate thing. It's still only a type that's subordinate to the archetype. And so even if, if the archetype itself cannot be venerated in this religious context, then what about the mere type that derives from yeah. that? What do you do and with that? We've been talking so far mainly about the idea of images of God. But remember, and for me, this is the biggest issue. Nicaea too says you can venerate images of apostles and angels not just God. 
So you can kiss a painting of St. Paul. You can kiss a painting of St. Peter. You can piss, um, kiss <laughs> a, a painting uh... of angels. You can bow before them. Uh, but we have these cases, th these texts right here, where it's saying you can't do that even in person. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any any sense that <laughs> I just... So what's Peter going to say to Cornelius? Cornelius, no, 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 you can't venerate me. That's very, very bad. Just wait till I'm dead, paint a little painting of me, and then you can venerate that painting, Cornelius. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. Uh, that's so true. I think, I think um, yeah, I think that's exactly what they actually said. Uh, that's exactly <laughs> what they said. Wait till I'm dead, then you can venerate my image. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I'm not worthy of veneration, God, no. But uh, artistic... And, and let someone say, me, oh, yeah, you can venerate them if they're dead because they're like glorified in heaven. No, Revelation 19.10. John is in heaven in yep. Revelation 19.10. He tries yeah. to venerate an angel while in heaven. And the angel says, you must not do that. Venerate God. And I do remember, um, not sure, I'm not sure actually if Nicaea 2 itself uses the exact wording, but I do remember clearly John of Damascus or some others mentioning how, and, and Orthodox more generally, referring to how icons are a window into heaven, you know. Um, and so here's John in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you, I, I actually am struggling to understand how you could how like what arguments someone could make here yeah. I, I don't I, I really I can't see it um, That's right. yep. a little question there someone said why did John think it'd be okay to bow down to being not sure just angels are obviously pretty cool so yeah, yeah. probably probably just a general thing i think it may be similar to like what happened with daniel when the same thing happened daniel fell and he was like petrified before the before the angel that appeared to him i think that'd just be a natural reaction like oh man whoa just oh man please don't do anything and then the angel's like calm down bro i'm not god just stand up <laughs> yeah